Christian died Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ in vain He suffered by his death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints That history cannot erase With iron heel and iron hand The Roman Pope ruled the land Those ignorant of history May be swept into apostasy We won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie With fifty million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone In Christ alone, by grace alone A sovereign God give faith to man Salvation's in the Maker's hand This gospel offends Rome today they offer up another way, a counterfeit, a compromise. Beware the ancient papal lie with such a cloud of witnesses who by grace died in their Lord. Recall their memory to say by the same faith we live today. Good evening. Welcome to Walt's Mystery Babylon News Radio. My name's Tom Press, and I'll be hosting tonight. We're continuing our reading and discussion of the book, Romanism and the Reformation from the Standpoint of Prophecy by Henry Grattan Guinness. Tonight, we're going to continue in Lecture 5 in this book, a key chapter in this book, Lecture Number 5, talking about the pre-Reformation interpreters of the prophecies. How did God's people, before the Protestant Reformation, how did God's people interpret the prophecies of Daniel, John, and Paul regarding the little horn of Daniel, the son of perdition, the man of sin of, of, of Paul, and also the Antichrist of John the Revelator? Who was this man of sin, the little horn, the son of perdition, the Antichrist of the Bible? Was it a pagan Roman Caesar? Or is it someone way off in the future not to be reckoned with until the last seven years before Christ returned to earth? Or has Antichrist been around all along? That's the subject of this chapter. Today, Protestants believe erroneously, wrongly, in a future Antichrist. One who does not come until the seven, within seven years before Christ's return. He's supposed to sign a peace treaty with the Jews, cause animal sacrifices and oblations to cease. But we know we historicists know that it was Jesus who fulfilled that prophecy, not the Antichrist of the Bible. So futurism is wrong. So is preterism. And those were the two alternatives that we talked about yesterday or last week. Now, it, by another means of refreshing your memories about what we talked about last time, remember in the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy is regarded as the as, as the as the replacement of the Son of God. He is Christ's vicegerent on the earth. He is Christ on earth. He's the mouthpiece of God on this earth, and he ought to be obeyed by divine right. He ought to be not only the King of Kings, but the Lord of Lords. He should sit in the place of Christ, and he should be obeyed unquestioningly. That is what is taught in the Roman Catholic Church. So 
when it comes to dealing with the prophecies regarding this little horn or the son of perdition or the man of sin or the Antichrist, why, it can't be the Pope. So the Roman Catholic Church teaches two alternatives, either the preterist interpretation, which puts the onus of Antichrist, the little horn, the man of sin, the son of perdition, on one of the old pagan Roman empires, uh, emperors like Nero or, or Caligula or some other pre-Christian church era figure. Or the second alternative is a future Antichrist, one that does not appear until the first, last seven years before Christ's return. Now, Roman Catholics teach both. Okay? It, because, because it simply can't be the Pope. He's the man. He's, he's the Son of God on earth, the Vicar of Christ. But that's not what the Protestant Reformers believed. The Protestant Reformers were neither preterist nor futurist. They were historicists. They saw the papacy all throughout its history as fulfilling every single prophecy regarding the little horn of Daniel, the son of perdition, the man of sin, the historical antichrist of the Bible. And they staked their lives on it, literally. Now, we give credit to the Protestants for standing up to the truth. But the Protestant Reformation took place in the 16th century. What did Christians believe prior to this time? We're going to talk about the two alternatives taught by the Roman Catholic Church and then what historical Protestantism taught. Yes, Protestantism existed long before the Protestant Reformation. Protestantism is literally a return to the ancient Christian belief, the first century church belief, and this chapter is going to prove it. Now we'll begin by backing up to the previous uh, to the beginning of the paragraph that we concluded with last week. One hour of reading today, and then one hour of discussion. Now we're going to talk about those two alternatives. There were only two alternatives. If the Antichrist were not a present power like the Pope, he must be either a past or a future one. Okay, if it's not the Pope then we have to place the onus of Antichrist on someone, right? It can't be the Pope, because he's the vicar of Christ on earth. So it must be either someone of the distant past or someone of the distant future, all right? He says there were only two alternatives. If the Antichrist were not a present power, like the Pope, he must be either a past or a future one. Some writers asserted that the predictions pointed back to Nero, okay? But we know that cannot be true because the Bible clearly says that the man of sin could not stand up until there was a falling away first. Well, prior to the Christian era, during the times of Nero, there was no Christian church, per se. Okay, so it could not be one of the pagan Caesars. We're talking about an apostasy. He says, some writers asserted that the predictions pointed back to Nero. This did not take into account the obvious fact that the anti-Christian power predicted, the Antichrist, was to succeed the fall of the Caesars. The fall of the Caesars and develop among the Gothic nations. Now remember, when Rome fell apart at the end of the pagan Roman Empire, the Roman Empire was broken up into ten Gothic nations. That's when the Caesars lost their power, and that power was transferred to the man of sin, the little horn, the son of perdition, the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist, the papacy, okay? 
Now, the author continues, he says, the other alternative became, therefore, the popular one among the papists, okay, the futurists. Antichrist was future. So Jesuit priest Ribera and Bossuet and others taught, okay? So here we have the Jesuit priests <clears throat> whose sworn oath demands that they destroy Protestantism and restore the papacy to his formal, former glory as, man of, uh, as king of kings and lord of lords. Now, the papacy was basically dethroned during the Protestant Reformation. It was the Jesuits' mission, a military mission, to defeat Protestantism. Why did they hate Protestantism so much? Because they put the onus of Antichrist, man of sin, son of perdition, little horn of Daniel, squarely on the papacy. That's where it belongs. He's the historical Antichrist. He's been tormenting God's people, destroying the Bible, destroying the faith of Jesus Christ, and putting the glory upon himself for nearly since the fall of the Roman Empire. Okay? He said again, the other alternative became, therefore, the popular one with papists. That is, futurism. If it can't be a, a past antichrist in the pagan Caesars, then it has to be a future one, because it simply can't be the Pope. He's God's voice on earth, right? I hope you're getting this. I'm, I'm being repetition. Uh, I'm being repetitious here, because this simply, I've found through experience that this is difficult to seek, sink in to someone who's been taught futurism all of his life. He continues, he said, Antichrist was future, so, uh, so Ribera and Bosuet and others taught. So these Jesuit priests taught futurism, a future Antichrist. Now, if you believe in a future Antichrist, then you've exonerated the papacy, haven't you? It's, 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 it's the default situation. I mean, if you believe in a future Antichrist, one that doesn't come before uh, seven years before Christ's return, then you've simply exonerated the papacy from the historical belief. You've destroyed the Protestant belief. You've destroyed the first century Christian belief, as we're soon to discover. Futurism is a lie. It's designed from the very beginning to protect the papacy from the Protestant view, the historicist view, that no one else on earth even qualifies for Antichrist but the papacy. No one else on earth, past, present, or future, fulfills all the Bible prophecies regarding Antichrist but the papacy. So if you believe anything other than that the Pope is the Antichrist of the Bible, then you believe the Catholic view. And they don't care whether you believe in a past Antichrist, Nero or Caligula, or a future Antichrist that the world hasn't even seen and isn't really terribly concerned about yet. And so the papacy goes on. And not only that, let me point out that since for the last two centuries, little over two centuries, Protestants have slowly departed from the historical belief, their Protestant belief, that the papacy is the Antichrist of the Bible, slowly but surely have taken the belief that the futurist interpretation of the prophecies is correct, therefore exonerating the historical papacy, the historical Antichrist. Now the Pope demands that since the Protestants have reneged on their Protestant beliefs, and since it was the Protestant Reformation that overturned the power of the Pope, who was before a king of kings and lord of lords, the very voice of God on earth, and reduced him to a tottering old fool in the Vatican, surrounded by gold, silver, and precious stones and pearls, now, if the Protestants admit they were wrong, 
and now believe in a future Antichrist, well, then it is their moral and bounden duties to not only restore all the power and strength of the Pope that he enjoyed before the Protestant Reformation, but to conquer the rest of the world for the Pope. And that's precisely what, quote, unquote, Protestant America is doing. It's an apostate nation. It has, it has departed from the truth. It still calls itself Protestant, which it is not. By definition, it is not Protestant and has now become a global crusader for the papacy simply because it bought the lie that the Pope is not the Antichrist. Do you see now why the United States has developed into the world policeman? That the United States can meddle in all the internal and external affairs of the nations? That the United States can go galloping off to war all over this world at our expense? Because we departed from Protestantism. We've allowed the Roman Catholic teaching to pervade our our Christian lives, and now our politicians and the leaders of the Christian world that have so much influence in Washington, D.C., demand that the papacy be restored, that Christianity, quote-unquote, should become the religion of the West, and it should be headed up by the papacy. And not only that, but we would restore the historical power of the Pope to persecute heretics to put down all the other pagan nations of the world and make them Catholic, just like America is Catholic. You see the grievous error? I don't think even Henry Grattan Guinness could have foretold or foreseen the horrors that would develop from Protestants departing from their Protestant faith, from departing from the historical belief that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of the Bible. We're paying for all these wars, not just by tax dollars, but our own sweat and blood and tears. What a tremendous cost it has come to those who once called themselves Protestant for departing from that Protestant belief. It's, it's a hideous reality, one that I'm sure is going to take a long time for my listeners to truly assimilate. But we'll continue. According to the Jesuits, Ribera and Basuet, Antichrist was not the Pope. He was future. And so others taught. It wasn't Jesuits that taught this. It was adopted by the Protestants. He says an individual man was intended by this Antichrist, not the dynasty of the papacy. The duration of his power, this single individual, would not be for 12 and a half centuries, but only three and a half years. Now remember, they get this three and a half years from Daniel 9.27. It's talking about the 70th week of Daniel. Seven years of time, In the midst of the week, he will cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. So that leaves three and a half years for this so-called Antichrist to rule. But it was Christ who caused the sacrifices and oblations to, to cease. Three and a half years after his anointing by John the Baptist in the River Jordan, three and a half years he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease by becoming the sacrifice himself. But that's not what the Jesuits teach us. The Jesuits teach us a future seven-year period of time. And for the last three and a half years of that seven-year period of time, the Antichrist is going to reign. And guess what? Rome prepared a false Antichrist so that the papacy can rise up as the vicar of Christ. Now, look, this 
people have trouble digesting this after being taught futurism for so many years. If you've got any questions or comments, you want some clarification on something I said, please, please, please email me and ask these questions. Let's make this clear in your minds. My email address is tom at seawaves.us. That's S-E-A-W-A-V-E-S dot U-S. Tom at seawaves.us. Let's make sure you understand what I'm saying here because this goes over the heads of people that are not accustomed to hearing this. And certainly if you're a churchgoer, you are not accustomed to hearing this. The churches are literally the source of the deception in Protestant America. They don't teach Protestantism in the Protestant churches. They teach futurism. That is Jesuitism. That is part of the Counter-Reformation. Look, we've rolled that Jesuit Trojan horse right into our churches. Satan is transformed into an angel of light, and therefore it should not surprise any of us that his his ministers are transformed into the ministers of righteousness. It's our ministers who are deceiving us. If Satan wanted to deceive us, how best would he do it? By corrupting our pastors. And he has. And here is the corruption. They've departed from Protestantism. And they've accepted the Roman Catholic interpretation of the prophecies. It's a hideous reality. And it has global consequences. And we're paying those consequences even now as we speak. Wars, wars, rumors of wars. Wars going on right this very minute. Missiles. Where are all, who's inciting all these wars? Rome. The United States is conducting her, 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 her papal proxy wars. We are her proxies. And we're just aligning the world to, for a phony fulfillment of this, 70, this so-called future 70th week of Daniel. When the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled by Jesus Christ perfectly and completely 2,000 years ago. Okay. According to the Jesuit Ribera and Bosuet, an individual man was intended as the Antichrist, not the dynasty of the papacy. The duration of his power would not be for twelve and a half centuries, but only three and a half years. He would be an open foe to Christ, not a false friend. Okay, the last time we talked about Judas Priest, right? Judas Iscariot. Only one other person in the Bible is called the son of perdition. It's Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot is a perfect model of the papacy. When you gain an understanding of the history of the popes, you will see the likeness that God literally used Judas Iscariot as a type of the eventual antitype, the papacy, okay? Now, here's another point I want to make before I continue. This phony antichrist that the papacy is going to put in place is going to be an open foe to Christ and an open foe to his people. And he's going to make war against Christ, Revelation 17, along about verse 18. He's going to make war against the Son of God, the Lamb, it is said. He will make war against the Lamb. How do you make war against the Lamb? By making war against his people. That's how the Antichrist, the papacy, made war against the Lamb all throughout history. That's exactly the way he's going to do it in the end times, too. He'll be an open foe to Christ, and that's why my program is called Inquisition Update, because there is going to be a government-sponsored religious persecution against true Bible Protestantism in this country, 
anybody who will stand up and condemn the papacy as antichrist will be considered a domestic terrorist or a religious fundamentalist wacko or a religious extremist. They've already got those names of denunciation spread all about for the for the uh, religious fanatical Muslims. They're about to apply, to apply the same denunciation against true Bible-believing Protestants. Peace-loving Protestants, we fight by just simply telling the truth, just like the Protestant Reformers did. But they're, we're going to be opposed. And this future Antichrist is going to be an open foe against God's true people. Now, also, the Jesuits taught that this Antichrist figure would be a Jew, and he would sit in a Jewish temple. Okay? Speculation about the future took the place of the study of the past and the present and careful comparison of the facts of history with the predictions of prophecy. There's where we have made our error in Protestantism. They could not have sold futurism to us if we were aware of history. If we were always aware of, of that or, or papal history or the history of the Roman Catholic Church, no one would ever have been able to trick us into believing that the papacy is anything but the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn, the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist, such as was believed by the Protestants and every true Bible-believing Christian all the way back to Christ. But they destroyed that history. It's not included in your history book. Does anybody in this listening audience remember in grade school or in high school or in postgraduate school ever being told that the papacy was considered the Antichrist of the Bible? Has anybody ever been told the history of the Roman Catholic Church, the history of the papacy? No. It's been completely written out of the history books. That way you cannot compare the history of the popes with the prophecies of the Bible and come to the same conclusion that God's people have always come to. All they had to do was erase the history of the papacy from the, from the school system, from the news media, from politics, from law, from everything. It's not talked about. As a matter of fact, if you talk about it openly, as I do on amateur radio, you're, re, you're labeled a religious fanatic. You're, re, you're labeled as someone that needs to be got rid of. They just simply will not tolerate the truth. Kind of sounds like backsliding Israel, doesn't it? That's because it is. We should have learned from their example. All right, he continues, and I've, I'm sorry I've got a lot of commentary about this part. Don't want to, I don't want you to miss what the author's trying to tell you. <clears throat> He's talking about the errors that the, the Jesuits began to teach to overthrow and to do away with the Protestant belief. Look, if they don't want us to believe that the Pope is the Antichrist, they've got to give us something alternative to believe in, right? That's what they did. Take your pick, preterism or futurism. That's what you'll get in the, in the so-called Protestant churches today, either preterism or futurism. There isn't but a handful of churches in this country that will teach the historical truth, the Protestant truth. <clears throat> Excuse me. Speculation about the future took the place of the study of the past and present and careful comparison of the facts of history with the predictions of prophecy. This related, so it was asserted, not to the main course of the history of the church, but only to the few closing years of her history. The papal head of the Church of Rome was not the power delineated by Daniel and St. John, say the, the Jesuit priests, Ribera and Bossuet. He says, accurately as it answered to the description, it was not the criminal indicated. 
So the Jesuits say no matter how perfectly the papacy fulfills all the prophecies of the Bible regarding the Antichrist, no matter how accurate the Bible tends, uh, seems to be in that regard, it can't be the Pope. Okay? Sounds like a counter-reformation teaching, doesn't it? Now it's the orthodox teaching in the so-called Protestant churches. That's what you get when you turn your back on the Jesuits. That's what you get when you forget Protestant history. He says the papal head of the Church of Rome was not the power delineated by Daniel and John, say the Jesuits. Accurately as it, was, as it answered to the description, it was not the criminal indicated. It must be allowed, the papacy, it must be allowed to go free, and the detective must look out for another man who was sure to turn up by and by. Okay? Futurism. There it is. Can't be the Pope, so it's got to be somebody off in the future. Where's the protest? What, what man is standing up today and saying, it's the papacy, you fool? That's what all believers before our time said. Why do you renounce Protestantism by believing in a future Antichrist? Why do you become Catholic by believing in a future Antichrist? The Bible calls the Protestant churches harlot daughters. Now you must understand why. He said the papacy must be allowed to go free, and the detective must look out for another man who was sure to turn up by and by. The historic interpretation was, of course, rejected with intense and bitter scorn by the Roman Catholic Church, the church it denounced as Babylon and the power it branded as Antichrist. And it is still opposed by all those who in any way uphold these. It's still opposed by me. It's still opposed by Walt. God help God's people to understand the historical truth taught in the scriptures as verified in history. Continuing now, he says, it is held by many that the historic school of interpretation, that is the Protestant school of interpretation, is represented only by a small modern sect of the church. We shall show that it has has existed from the beginning. Let me repeat that. Henry Grattan Guinness says, we shall show that historicism, the Protestant teaching of the, the school, uh, school of prophecy called historicism that was taught by the Protestant reformers has existed from the very beginning all the way back to Christ. This is where people challenge me. They say Protestantism rose up during the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. It's the new kid on the block. No, the fact of the matter is, Protestantism is the foundation. You're going to find out, Henry Gretton Guinness is going to prove to you that the earliest Christians believed that that power that stood up immediately after the destruction of the pagan Roman Caesars would be the little horn of Daniel, the son of perdition, the man of sin, the antichrist of John. It would be the papacy. And they not only knew that that power would arise after the, the, the fall of the Caesars, they even prayed for the longevity of the Caesars so that Antichrist could not appear. So Protestantism was the oriental, the original belief of Bible Christians. The earliest Christians knew that the power spoken of would be Rome, but it would not be Rome pagan. It would be Rome papal. It would, 
it, it is held by many that the historic school of interpretation is represented only by a small modern sect of the church. We shall show that it has existed from the beginning and includes the larger part of the greatest and best teachers of the church for 1,800 years. We shall show that the fathers, the quote-unquote fathers of the church, belong to the future, to the historicist interpretation that the most learned medieval commentators belong to it, that the confessors, reformers, and martyrs belong to it, and that it has included a vast multitude of erudite expositors of the latter times. We shall show that all these have held to the central truth that prophecy faithfully mirrors the church's history as a whole and not merely a commencing or closing fragment of that history. It is held by many that the futurist school of interpretation is represented chiefly by certain Protestant commentators and teachers who deny that the prophecy of the man of sin relates to the Pope of Rome. We shall show that the futurist school of interpretation, on the contrary, is chiefly represented by teachers belonging to the Church of Rome, that popes, cardinals, bishops, and priests of that apostate church are all futurists, and that the futurist interpretation is one of the chief pillars of Romanism. And let me tell you, it is one of the, if not the chief pillar of the Jesuit-led counter-reformation. The easiest way to destroy Protestantism is to destroy its core belief. And the core belief of Protestantism was that the papacy was the fulfillment of the prophecies of Daniel, Paul, and John. The little horn, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, and if you could destroy that one single pillar that holds up the, 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 the facade of Protestantism, the whole thing falls into a heap. And all they had to do was sell us a future Antichrist. Just change the identity of the he spoken of in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Change the identity of that he from Christ to to Antichrist, and all of Protestantism falls down around our ears, and that's exactly what they did. That's where futurism came from. They took the 70th week of Daniel, the seven years of Christ's ministry, from his baptism until the stoning of Stephen, and they gave that over to Antichrist, who was going to have a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews, going to let them build a temple, begin animal sacrifices again, and so he can cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease after three and a half years. And all the world's wars have been fought to prop up this futurist lie. It's all part of the the Jesuit-led counter-reformation. They've destroyed Protestantism. Now, those who were once Protestant are fighting in the Pope's crusades around the world to literally help the papacy manually fulfill a phony, futurist seven years of tribulation, which is never even spoken of in the Bible. If you can find me one reference, one single reference in all of God's word to a seven-year period of quote-unquote great tribulation, send it to me. I don't have much money, but you can have all the money I got if you can find me one, one, even one reference to a seven-year period of tribulation in God's word. It's not there. It's simply not there. That should lead us to believe that what they're teaching in the church today is a lie. 
a Jesuit lie, a counter-reformation lie. And the purpose of it all is to make us all Catholic in our beliefs without telling us. And it has worked. He says, two interpretations of prophecy are before us, the historic and the futurist, the Protestant and the Roman Catholic. Okay? Historic interpretation of the prophecies is Protestant. The futurist interpretation of the prophecies is Roman Catholic. The historical school of interpretation regards these prophecies as reflecting the history of the fourth final, and Roman Empire. Remember, we're talking about the fourth empire upon the earth, first Medo-Persia, then Greece, or rather rather Babylon, then Medo-Persia, then Greece, and then Rome. Daniel didn't include a fifth. And that Roman power was in, was in control of the world when, when Christ was born. That Roman power tried to kill him in his crib, forced him to flee to Egypt. Okay, And that Roman power is still in power today. It has never ceased to be the controlling power of the United States of, of, of the world, and especially of the United States of America. All this talk about a British empire, not mentioned in the scriptures. Why? Because Rome is the power behind the British empire. The Roman empire continues from the time of Christ until his return. There's no fifth empire mentioned in the scripture. There's anything in history, recent modern history, that calls itself an empire, you can bet your bippy the Bible would have mentioned it. And since it doesn't mention it, you must accept that Rome is still the power behind it, and that includes England, the British Empire. It's a servant of Rome. It is controlled by Rome. It professes Protestantism, but it is ecumenical and futurist. It is returning to Rome. It's just simply one of Rome's harlot daughters, just as is the United States, once claiming itself Protestant, which has now renounced its Protestant belief, accepting the Jesuit futurist belief, and has gone about all the world fighting the Pope's wars for him. Okay? Popes and cardinals and bishops and priests believe in futurism. And if you believe in futurism, you simply cannot be a Protestant. You cannot be a Protestant. If you don't believe the, the, the papacy is the antichrist of history and of the Bible and the prophecy, you, you simply cannot legitimately call yourself a Protestant. And nor should you be accepted by Protestants as a Protestant. You want to believe like a Roman? You ought to just be with the Romans. There's two interpretations of prophecy of the us: the historic and the futurist. That's equivalent to saying the Protestant and the Roman Catholic. The historical school of interpretation regards these prophecies as reflecting the history of the fourth or Roman Empire in all its most important aspects, from the first to last, including especially the dark apostasy, which has long prevailed in Christendom, the testimony and sufferings of God's faithful people amid this apostasy, and the ultimate triumph of their cause. Yes, I'm telling you, the Bible speaks of nothing but the Roman Catholic Church in prophecy. The Roman Catholic Church has killed more Bible-believing Christians than you could even believe. And like last time, I recommended, if you are having trouble with any of this, then somebody needs to prove to you the history of the Roman Catholic Church and how she has literally soaked the earth with the blood of God's people. For 1,800 years, she has soaked the, blood, the, the earth with the blood of God's people. 
If you ever want to see one fulfillment of Bible prophecy that will convince you of Rome's true role in the world as the church, the synagogue of Satan, and that the Pope is the Antichrist, simply read about the Inquisitions and the Crusades. Fox's Book of Martyrs. There are plenty of history books. You won't find them in your schools. You certainly won't hear any commentators on the mainstream media talking about them. You are most likely never going to hear a Protestant pastor talk about them, especially one who is ecumenical. So you got to do it yourself. You got to find these books yourself. You got to read them for yourself. The whole world is supporting this new world order for the Pope. Nobody's going to help you with this. You have to help yourself. And don't take my word for it. Listen, if I take, if you just sit there and take my word for everything, well, then you can when when the opportunity presents itself and it's and it's uh, advantageous to you, you can simply deny it. Okay, you've got an easy out. You haven't invested any time, any sweat, any blood, any tears researching this stuff. You just sit, sit in front of your computer, in front of the radio, and you listen to Tom Press talk about the Inquisitions and the Pope's the Antichrist and yada, yada, yada. Well, when they come for you to lop off your head, you can simply say, well, I think Tom's wrong. Don't give yourself that option. Read it yourself with your own eyes. Do some of your own research. Find out what Protestantism was about. You, you, you know what should just stymie my listeners tonight? Most Protestants don't even know what it means. Protestant. They don't even recognize that the root of that word is protest. Nor did they think to ask the question, what did they protest? They protested Rome, the Antichrist. They protested the papacy, the Antichrist. They protested the false doctrines, the works gospel of the Roman Catholic Church, the synagogue of Satan. They protested that the Pope should be the King of kings and the Lord of lords on earth, that he was a wicked sinner, and that they should, they should obey Christ and not man. And there aren't any churches that call themselves Protestants will even talk about these things. Who got control of the churches? Who left out the foundation of Protestantism in the Protestant churches? It had to be an organized effort. It had to be an extraordinary effort to deceive God's people to the extent that they are deceived today. I know it's painful to admit that you believed a lie all your life, but I had to do it. And let me tell you, when I did it, I'm free to worship Christ and him only and to denounce Antichrist. I'm no longer fearful. I'm liberated, celebrating in the freedom that Christ has made me free. If you want to remain in bondage, remain in futurism. If you want liberty, accept historicism. It's a new life. And it puts Christ back on his rightful throne. Only then are you worthy to serve him. He says, on the other hand, the futurist school of interpretation regards these prophecies as dealing almost exclusively with the distant future of the consummation, regards them as dealing chiefly not with what has been for the last 1,800 years, but with what will be in the some final spasm at the close, okay? Futurism just simply wipes out all of history. 
puts all of your concern on the last seven or some cases the last three and a half years of history. Did Christ die on the cross to save us from the Antichrist who would only reign for three and a half years at the close of time just before his return? Or did he die to save us from the historical Antichrist? one that would torment God's people for nearly 2,000 years before his return. The Bible says that we'd be tried as if by fire. How is God's people going to be tried as if by fire if that fire doesn't come within the, only the last three and a half years before Christ's return? It defies common sense, not just history and the Bible. We've got to depart from this futurist lie. He says the war against the saints waged by the Roman little horn of the prophecies of Daniel, the proud usurpations of the man of sin and his antagonism to the cause of true religion foretold by Paul, the blasphemous pretensions and persecuted deeds of the revived head of the Roman Empire set forth in the prophecies of John, all of these are regarded by this futurist school as relating to a brief future period immediately preceding the second advent of Christ. The futurist school denies the application of these important practical prophecies to the conflicts of the church during the last 18 centuries. It robs the Church of Christ of their practical guidance all through that period. This is the position taken by the Church of Rome. This is the position taken by the popes, the cardinals, archbishops, bishops, and other great teachers of that apostate church, the Antichrist Church of the Bible. This is the prophetic interpretation they have embodied in a thousand forms and insisted upon with dogmatic authority. This has been the interpretation of proud papal usurpers, of cruel persecutors, of merciless tyrants, and of Romanist enemies of the gospel and of the saints and the servants of God. We shall find, on the other hand, as we study the subject, that the historic interpretation of the prophecy, the interpretation, the interpretation which condemns Rome and which Rome consequently condemns grew up gradually with the progress of events and the development of the apostasy of Latin Christianity. That it slowly modified its details under the illuminating influence of actual facts but that it retained its principles unaltered from age to age. That it was defended by a multitude of earnest students and faithful expositors, and that it shaped the history of heroic struggles and of glorious revivals of spiritual life and testimony. This is the interpretation whose history during 15 centuries we propose to review this evening we shall divide these 15 centuries into three periods. Number one, the period extending from apostolic times. Remember, true Bible Protestantism is the Oriental apostolic teaching. Paul knew who that man of sin was. He said it would rise up as soon as the Caesars were, were, were out of the way. Okay, the period extending from apostolic times to the fall of the Roman Empire in the 5th century. Number two, the period extending from the fall of the Roman Empire to the rise of the papacy in the 5th century to its exaltation under the pontificate of Gregory VII, or Hildebrand, the founder of the papal theocracy in the 11th century. Okay, we're talking about first pagan Rome, first, first of all, we're going to talk about what they believed in apostolic times, then we're going to talk about pagan Rome, and then its evolution into papal Rome. And let me tell you, there's not much evolution there. 
okay? Rome pagan is now called Rome papal, okay? What's in a name? You judge Rome by her fruits. And let me tell you, when it comes to killing God's people, our history books will tell us that the pagan Roman empires persecuted and fed Christians to the lions, okay? Making fun of the prophecies of Daniel. That is included in some of our school history books. Never a word is said about the untold, the untold millions upon millions of God's true people that papal Rome has killed. Look, Rome has killed more of God's people. I'm talking about papal Rome has killed more of God's people, so many of God's people that it would put the pagan Caesars to shame. Okay? When it came to killing God's people, The pagan Caesars were pikers compared to the popes of Rome. And the third period they're going to talk about is the period from Pope Gregory VII to the Protestant Reformation. First, then, let us look, take a glance at the history of prophetic interpretation in the interval extending from apostolic times to the fall of the Roman Empire, the 5th century. This was the period of the so-called fathers of the Christian church. A multitude of their writings remain to us, containing not only almost countless references to the prophecies in question, but complete commentaries on Daniel and the Apocalypse. It is boldly claimed by many that the fathers of the first five centuries held the futurist interpretation of these books. We deny the correctness of this position and assert that the fathers of the first five centuries belonged to the historical school of interpretation. It was impossible for them, owing to the early position which they occupied, rightly to anticipate the manner and the scale of the fulfillment of these wondrous prophecies. But as far as their circumstances permitted, they correctly grasped the general significance and adhered to the interpretation which regards prophecy as foretelling the whole course of the church's warfare from the first century to the second advent. Listen to that again. They say that history foretells the, or that prophecy foretells the entire life of the church of Christ. From its birth in apostolic times until the return of Jesus Christ. Prophecy does not talk about just seven years of time just before Christ returns. He continues, he said, it is impossible at this time to do more than present a brief summary of the views of the fathers on this subject and to name and refer you to their works. In other words, this author is going to present to you the names of of popular works of early, early Christians that you can research for yourself. Number one, the fathers interpreted the four wild beasts of prophecy as representing four empires, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Here we have the foundation of the historical interpretation of prophecy, the Protestant interpretation of prophecy. Take as an instance the words of Hippolytus on the great image of the four wild beasts of Daniel. Quote, the golden head of the image, he says, is identical with the lioness by which the Babylonians were represented. The shoulders and the arms of silver are the same with the bear by which the Persians and the Medes are meant. The belly and the thighs of brass are the leopard, are the leopard by which the Greeks who were ruled by Alexander onwards, are intended. The legs of iron are the dreadful and terrible beast by which the Romans, who now hold the empire, are meant. The toes of clay and iron are the ten horns which are to be. The one other little horn springing up in their midst is the Antichrist, The stone that smites the image and breaks it in pieces and that fills the whole earth is Christ, 
who comes from heaven, not Rome, who comes from heaven and brings judgment on the world. This statement is remarkable for its clearness, correctness, and, con- uh, and, con- and condensation and expresses the view held still by the historic school of interpretation, the Protestant school of interpretation. Now, we're running out of time. Henry Grattan Guinness is getting right to it. He's proving to you that the, er- the earliest church expositors, first century church expositors, understood the prophecies of Daniel, and they rightly interpreted them. And they formed the basis of the historical, the Protestant interpretation of the scriptures. Any one of these church fathers would never have accepted a futurist interpretation, at least of those who knew that the power that replaced the Caesars would be the Antichrist of the Bible. They expected that in their day. And it only was the fifth century before it became a reality. God was prompt in answering his prophecies, leaving none of his people to doubt who the Antichrist is. Just as he leaves no room for doubt as to who Christ is in the scriptures, God leaves no room for doubt in history and prophecy about who the Antichrist is. God does not deal treacherously with his people. We've come to the end of our time. We'll make a mark here. We'll come back here next week. We'll take a short break, and then uh, we'll come back and have some discussion. I hope and pray God has led you to understand the truth of history. And we'll look this book next time. If you want to email me again, tom at seawaves.us, tom at seawaves.us, and tune in Monday through Friday on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 10 a.m. Central Time for Inquisition Update, where we'll continue to read good Protestant works warning God's people about the Inquisition that is about to befall them. We must start at the foot of the cross. For our souls in danger, we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know, there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. You're God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. To the prison of hell he will send, just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away, go to the foot of the cross this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross, without our Savior, we're total lost.